Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be sharing with you today. I hope everybody can see this okay. So in the next little while, I'm going to share with you not only some information, but putting it together in a new way. Because I care about osteoporosis personally. I watched my grandmother become shorter and shorter and getting getting hunched over with fractures, as I now know, in her in her spine. And a similar thing happened to my mom. So I wanted all my life to prevent that happening to me. And I wanted to understand why it happened and how to prevent it. So listen today with an open heart to try to understand the new way I'm going to try to present it to you. So first of all, I have no conflicts of interest and I am grateful to be living in the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples of BC. And I think the slide gives away that I think progesterone is rather beautiful in this uh, light micrograph here. So today we're going to start by talking about how bone preserves itself or renovates itself because these basic ideas are not always universally known and because they're essential for understanding both how to prevent and to treat osteoporosis. We're going to talk in a, in a way that's probably unusual for many of you about menstrual cycles and how they provide us with estrogen and progesterone that we need for our bone health for the rest of our lives. Then we'll talk about the not very strong but increasing evidence that the bone formation, not just stopping bone loss, is what adds to fracture prevention. And finally, ask the question, if women are symptomatic with night sweats and hot flushes and sleep problems, which progesterone helps, and if we think that progesterone added to an antiresorptive drug could work with it to prevent fractures, why that might be a good idea as we get older. So we want to prevent fractures. We're not trying to change bone density as much as we're trying to prevent that broken bone that really disables us. Starting with the most common fracture of all. Anybody know what it is for women? It's the forearm. What about men? What's the most common fracture in men? I bet you wouldn't guess that it's rib fracture. That's data from the Canadian Multicenter Osteoporosis Study. So how does adult bone renew itself? I mean, like every tissue, bone becomes old. We need to get rid of what's old and we need to replace it with something stronger. So that's the purpose of bone remodeling or renovation. And first of all, we have to put it in the context of women's lives. So during adolescence, during childhood and adolescence, we rapidly gain bone, actually 10% a year in the, in the years just before the first period, and reach something that's called peak bone mass. That's a, as strong a bone as we'll ever have in our lives. And by that point, we're menstruating regularly and hopefully ovulating regularly and having estrogen and progesterone in balance. And if that is the case, we can preserve our bone density through until we hit the rapid bone loss that's normal in per late perimenopause and early menopause. And what I think is useful about this diagram is, and I've used actual data, is that the rates of bone loss in each of these phases put together if we preserve peak bone mass through uh, our menstruating years, we won't risk becoming getting a fracture until we're in our 80s. And that's a good thing. We're not 
you know, we can prevent early life fractures. So we're talking about bone remodeling. And I think you can see it has to differ when we're gaining bone, preserving bone or losing bone. So first, first point is that it's composed of two parts. And as the graph, the sort of diagram here implies, it's like it's like uh, tearing up the street to put in new water pipes or something, the backhoe here, and then eventually filling it in and putting uh, cement or whatever over the surface of the, of the road again. Or it's like remodeling the kitchen. You have to tear out the old sink and stove and cupboards and everything before you can put in new stuff. So it's got two phases and it's got two main cells that are related. So let's start over here with bone resorption. Bone resorption is controlled from basically the same cells in the bone marrow that make red cells and white cells. And eventually we end up with a grown up osteoclast that's a big multinucleated cell. See all these? that has pseudopodia that reach out and basically dissolve the, the old bone, which is then taken away by macrophages. Just to give you an idea, here's a, a electron micrograph of an osteoclast. And here's the pit that it's dug out in the surface of the bone. And you can notice here that those pseudopodia, those arms that go out like a starfish are all tucked in. What's interesting is that this slide shows an osteoclast response to calcitonin, a hormone that acts in bone that was discovered here at UBC by Dr. Harold Kopp, one of my mentors. Well, when osteoclasts are chewing away at bone, they make these scalloped areas on bone surfaces. This is cancellous bone from the inside of the iliac crest. And you can see this is pretty skinny strut. They should be big like this. And here's a strut that's broken. Totally, you can understand how this bone would be losing strength. Here in a slide, basically a microscopic slide of bone, which is in this one stained a green color, mineralized bone. Here's the bone marrow out here. And I think you can see these multinucleated globs of osteoclasts or groups of osteoclasts. And look, here they are breaking through a strut in bone. This is the process that leads to weak bones. So let's go back now and talk about the other side of the bone remodeling equation, which is bone formation. Now the cells that are important here come from a different cell type entirely. These are cells that are similar to ligament, tendon, muscle cells. And eventually, the osteoblast, the mature grown up osteoblast is made. And when this pit has been dug out, then the osteoclast, osteoblasts come in and start laying down this protein matrix, the, the ground substance of bone, which is called osteoid. That's their job. And then it is, it is calcified gradually over time using the calcium phosphate and all the other minerals it needs from the blood supply. Now, in contrast to the multinucleated giant cells that are the osteoclasts, osteoblasts are tidy and small. Some people like to joke that they work for the union, um, but when hormones, and they've got many bosses here, parathyroid hormone, testosterone, progesterone, and steroids like uh, prednisone, for example, all sit on receptors. But when most of them, all except steroids, sit there, they make 
more osteoblasts and they make the osteoblasts lay down more osteoid. So they, they have a positive receptor actions on the bone. So here's a slide again, the green mineralized bone. This whole row are osteoblasts working hard. And here you can see the unmineralized osteoid that will eventually become green like this. And here's bone marrow again. So now the next idea, and I already hinted at it, is that resorption, the process of resorption is very fast, but the process of formation is slow. So I learned from um, Michael Parfit in the 1980s, he was one of the gurus of, of osteoporosis, that it takes only about three weeks to dig out a resorption pit in a, any small area of bone. But in that same area, it takes three months at least before that resorption pit is filled in by the osteoblasts laying down new osteoid. And it takes many months longer for that osteoid to be mineralized. So these two processes are unbalanced. And in fact, they're more unbalanced in nature in humans than they are in most animals. That's why there aren't very many ways in which we can learn about human bone from animal studies. So let's review. Bone renovation rates vary across the life cycle. Bone loss or resorption is fast and formation or bone gain is very slow. That and this is something I haven't said before. And that is that when we're rapidly losing bone, we're at increased risk for fracture. Those are data that come from the Canadian Multicenter Osteoporosis Study. Um, the other, and this is also something that I only implied earlier, is that we've got two processes, two different cell types, but they're tightly coupled or linked together. What does that mean? That means when you decrease bone resorption, you decrease bone formation. Or when you increase bone resorption, you increase bone formation. And because of their timing, usually the formation doesn't keep up. So that means if we take a strong anti-resorptive medicines like we have now to treat osteoporosis, that we will, without meaning to, be decreasing bone formation. And that has implications for risk for fracture. Now, let's go back to the premenopausal years, young women's lives when they're having menstrual cycles and talk about two other hormones. Now, estrogen and progesterone. So most of you have seen this kind of a diagram. We, I, I at least learned about it in grade seven, I think. And it shows estrogen levels here in solid rising to a peak in the middle of the cycle, dropping down a bit, rising again, and then falling again before the next flow about a month or a moon cycle, 28 days on average. And a second hormone that's low for the first half of the cycle and then makes a big peak in the second half. So those are the two hormones that are present during women's menstruating lives, the two important reproductive hormones. So what do we know about them and bone? Well, first of all, estrogen is a very effective hormone at slowing bone loss. So when, when resorption is out of control, it's, you know, running away with itself, estrogen is excellent at slowing that down, at preventing bone loss and therefore at preventing fracture. So Estrogen is in fact the sort of archetypal or the, the original bone anti-resorptive 
hormone or medicine. And as we said before, steady levels of estrogen or E2 decrease bone resorption, and that's a very important good thing. So what's interesting is that estrogen controls bone resorption in both women from our first period until old age, as well as in older men. That's important. But here's the kicker. Here's the thing that we don't often think about. Decreasing or dropping estrogen levels stimulate bone resorption. Isn't that weird? That's not a good thing. Plus, at that time that they're dropping, they increase a massive release of stress hormones and cytokines and brain things happen. And they're associated with both night sweats and with sleep problems. So dropping estrogen is a really dramatic and difficult thing for the body to manage. And it's something that needs to be taken care of to prevent bone loss. Okay, back to the, the hormones and the menstrual cycle again. Let's talk about progesterone. First of all, progesterone isn't made in any quantity until after an egg is released. So egg release and progesterone go together. And then there's a, a time, a, a duration that's necessary. And the reason that there's a, a duration is because it takes that long to change the lining of the uterus so that an egg could implant if you were getting pregnant. So it take, you need about 10 to 16 days of high levels of progesterone in the normal menstrual cycle. Remember, we talked about progesterone sitting on an osteoblast receptor. Well, that's a very specific receptor. And in fact, steroids try to budge in on that receptor and progesterone is the stronger of the two and displaces steroids from their receptor because when when prednisone for example is sitting there it makes the osteoblast go home and get sick and stop working so that's no good so progesterone sits on a specific its own osteoblast receptor and builds new bone so progesterone builds new bone estrogen slows bone loss again to different hormones, two different renovating processes. Now, just as an aside, I've been working for a long time on the menstrual cycle and its relationship with women's health, and only recently have put together the strong evidence that we need balanced estrogen and progesterone, not just for bone, but to prevent heart attacks, to prevent breast cancer, obviously to prevent endometrial cancer. So we need both hormones for optimal women's health. Why? Estrogen works as a powerful growth stimulator. And that's excellent, we need it. But if growth continues or proliferation, there's chances of mistakes and that can lead to cancer. So progesterone has two jobs. One is to decrease or control the proliferation caused by estrogen. And the second is to help cells become mature or differentiate. So if you're interested, there's the link to this recent paper and uh, it's open access, so it's accessible to everybody. But in the process of trying to explain why both were necessary and what balance levels mean, we redrew the way we needed to re redraw the way we see the menstrual cycle because the typical way we do it is rather biased actually. And it doesn't have any units of measurement. And the reason is because estrogen is in picamoles and progesterone in nanomoles and they're a thousand fold different. Nanomoles is bigger. But if you say, how does estrogen change in percentages across the cycle? And how does progesterone 
change in percentages across the cycle, then you can compare them directly, which is what we've done here. So estrogen rises to its peak about 230% above its baseline, drops down a little, rises to about 100% above baseline, and then falls again before flow. And progesterone is low the whole first half and then rises to a peak that's about 1400% above baseline. Those two Comparative levels are necessary for balanced actions of progesterone and estrogen. So does it matter? Yes, it does. So we can have, and these rectangles are symbolic of the menstrual cycle, we can have perfectly regular cycles and not make any progesterone at all, have some progesterone, but not enough to get pregnant, or have normal duration of progesterone. The difficult thing is that we can't, no doctor, no woman herself can tell whether her cycle is like this or this or this. And the tricky thing is that it's usually stress that's responsible for these changes or call them ovulatory disturbances, changes in the amount of progesterone that's made. And those are the common changes that occur. It's very uncommon to have really long cycles or to skip cycles altogether. The problem we have is that ovulation and therefore progesterone production in the menstrual cycle is silent or subclinical if you want to use medical talk. And what we've learned is that silent ovulatory disturbances, in other words, in regular menstrual cycles that make enough estrogen is related to bone loss and likely is related to increased risk for breaking bones. So I'm going to show you two studies now um, because they're important for you to understand this. So when I was wet behind the ears, a brand new uh, young person in academic endocrinology, I was troubled by the messages that we were getting that running training for marathons was going to make women lose their period, lose bone, be in really bad shape. So I said, wait a minute, what if we started with healthy women, normal weight, who were already running a lot? And we made sure that they were already normally ovulating and normally cycling. And then we just followed them across the year and kept track of the exercise they did. So that's what we did. They were non-smokers, they were normal weight, they were 20 to 42 years old. And we looked at what changes occurred in spine bone. Now this was before we had DEXA. So we figured out how to measure bone change by using a QCT, a CT scanner. And we measured and documented ovulation and cycle lengths for the whole year. And here's what we found. Don't, don't worry, it's not complicated. I'll walk you through it here. So here is no change in bone, okay? And here we're looking at the change percent or milligrams per centimeter squared of this CT change. And down here, we're looking at women who had different cycle experiences the whole year. So we're putting together, all of them had mostly perfectly regular 21 to 36 day cycles. Okay, 13 of the women had normal ovulation, normal luteal phase lengths, normal cycle lengths the whole year. 12 women had one short luteal phase, 28 women had two or more in a year, and 13 had at least one cycle where they didn't ovulate, didn't make any progesterone, and usually also some short luteal phases. And what do you see? Look at that. This, this makes a absolutely incredible sort of dose response. In other words, if you have enough progesterone, you're not changing bone. But if you don't have it even in one cycle, you're losing bone. 
And in fact, 20% of the change in this bone density was accounted for by the average length of the luteal phase, which is a measure of how much progesterone during that whole year. Okay? So now, a skill testing question. If you have enough estrogen and estrogen slows bone loss, why would you lose bone in a normal length menstrual cycle? Well, remember that as estrogen levels decrease, there's increased bone loss. So what we now know, and I didn't know for a long time, is that this dropping from mid-cycle to the next flow was enough to produce a little bit of bone resorption that we need progesterone's bone formation to counterbalance. Does that make sense? It does to me. Okay, now I'm showing you a meta-analysis of data from all the studies we could find, this was published in 2014, that had both examined ovulation luteal phase length and change in spinal bone density. So what we're looking at here is first, here's no change in bone density, bone loss or bone gain. And here are a whole bunch of different studies. Don't worry about the numbers over here. So what I already showed you, that first study, and I forgot to say that it didn't matter if women were training for a marathon or if they just did a little tennis on the weekend or played with the kids in that previous study. In other words, it wasn't their sports training that was having a problem. It was not ovulating that caused bone loss. So we followed the same women five years later but here we only had a few, like three months just before we did the bone density again cycles. And so we couldn't show any relationship because we didn't have enough documentation. Here's a study from the United States. They used urine documentation of ovulation in a way that was a bit dicey and not validated really. And that showed no relation, but here one from Australia here a study out of Toronto, and here a study of uh, over 100 young women for two years um, at UBC. All of these showed, and the balance altogether shows a highly significant rate of bone loss if there's worse ovulatory disturbances than if ovulation is better. And we used where we could within each group, we used the median split of the occurrence of ovulation. So it's 0.86 of 1% a year, almost 1% bone loss a year that's happening silently if we're stressed and we don't consistently ovulate. Now, let me just put together all of this information. This is something that is not in the average textbook yet. It's something that is evidence-based but hasn't been adopted by the bone field in general. But there's good evidence, strong scientific evidence that progesterone is women's physiologic bone formation stimulating hormone. So why do we say that? It has specific osteoblast receptors there's been many studies that show when progesterone is around, alkaline phosphatase, P1NP, the markers of bone formation go up. I showed you the meta-analysis in a bunch of studies that women are losing almost 1% of their spinal bone, even if they have enough estrogen, if they're not ovulating normally. And we did, and I'm not going to show you the, the data here, we did a randomized controlled trial for women who had amenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, regular cycles, but no ovulation, regular cycles, short luteal phase. So a whole spectrum from estrogen, not enough estrogen to not enough, enough estrogen and not enough progesterone. And that showed a highly positive effect of 
10 days of progestin that acts through the osteoblast receptor, progesterone receptor, was highly significant. So women that got that progestin were gaining 3% bone, spinal bone in one year. Those who had double placebos didn't get calcium either. We gave an additional gram of calcium a day. We're losing 2% of their spinal bone a year. So it was a highly significant effect, we can say cause of increased bone density from something acting like progesterone. Okay, so now you've got the basics. Let's talk a little bit about bone formation and fracture because we know lots about anti resorptive therapies and fracture, but we don't know or think very much about bone formation. So now we're talking not about premenopausal women, but about peri and menopausal women. So let's back up a second. We used to think about menopause that starts a year after the last flow as a time of estrogen deficiency. And it's quite true. Estrogen levels are low. Anybody guess what I'm going to say next? Progesterone levels are also low. So if we have to talk about estrogen deficiency, let's also say there's progesterone deficiency. But at any rate, that's the reality is that we've thought for a long time that menopause meant estrogen deficiency, therefore treating with estrogen or treating with something for bone that works like estrogen, anti-resorptive bone loss stopping therapy would be good to prevent fractures, okay? The other good thing is that estrogen also is effective at treating night sweats. It's not so good at helping sleep, however. Here's uh, something you've probably not thought of before. Remember, dropping estrogen levels are associated with night sweats and hot flushes. They're associated with sleep problems, and they're also associated with increased bone loss and risk of fracture. Well, we know now that women with worse hot flushes are more likely to have hip fractures. In a huge observational study over many years from the United States, those women with the worst hot flushes at baseline compared to those with mild or none had 78% increased risk of fracture or almost doubled the risk of fracture of those who had very little in terms of hot flushes initially. So we're linking that rapid bone loss and night sweats and hot or rapid estrogen loss and, and hot flushes and hip fracture. So it, it makes sense. The brain reacts and the bone reacts to dropping estrogen levels. Well, sleep problems in epidemiologic studies are also associated with increased fractures. And this happened to be a study from Sweden, a population-based midlife women's and men's study. And the risk and the range is wide because in different women and different and men at different ages. But again, about two times increased risk for fracture in those with worse sleep problems than in those with fine, no problem sleeping. Now, the good news is that progesterone, based on randomized controlled trial data, effectively treats hot flushes and night sweats without adverse events, and also significantly improves disturbed sleep. So there's Maybe a reason to use progesterone to stimulate bone formation and also to use it for those older women who are at risk for fracture who also have hot flushes and night sweats or sleep problems. So we know very well, and this is a randomized controlled trial study of different doses of estrogen. These different lines are different doses here estrogen increases bone density compared to the placebo. This was uh, 
done a few years ago to see if we could prevent bone loss with very low doses of conjugated equine estrogen or, or Premarin. But we don't any longer use estrogen to treat fractures or prevent fractures in older women because of a very important study. It's called the Women's Health Initiative. WHI began in the 1900s. The first results were in 2002. A huge number of women, and there were two different hormone trials, one with estrogen alone and one with estrogen progestin. And what we learned is in women, and these were healthy, normal, not complaining, not sick women, we found that there was an overall, compared to placebo, an increased risk of blood clots, heart attacks, dementia, and for the estrogen progestin group, an increased risk of breast cancer. Therefore, although estrogen, both estrogen and estrogen progestin in those trials significantly prevented fractures, the increased risks led to policy across the board no longer and no longer using estrogen or endorsing estrogen and progestin for fracture or osteoporosis treatment. But we have a number of therapies currently that do work like estrogen as anti-resorptive medicines. You're familiar with them, alendronate, rosedronate, raloxifen, denosumab, and I didn't put on here zoledronic acid. These are absolute fracture prevention rates. So you can see these numbers. We're more used to thinking about fracture prevention, for example, in the spine as 50% less than placebo. But these are the absolute amounts. And we have only one authorized medicine that's used for fracture prevention, that's effective at fracture prevention, both in non-vertebral and spine, which is called PTH or teriparatide. So we're still concentrating on one side of that bone remodeling equation. We're ignoring what happens to formation still. There's a problem and that is if you over suppress both resorption and formation. You're leaving old bone there. You're leaving bone that's fragile. Bone isn't renewing itself as it would normally. It's not replacing with new bone. And there's a general consensus that that increases the risk, especially for these weird fractures that can happen in the long bone of the femur and our leg. These are extremely rare but they can be devastating. And they are, they are so rare that no one should worry about this a lot and stop their anti-resorptive osteoporosis medicine if they need it. But one wonders if you stopped bone resorption and you promoted formation, if you could prevent that, maybe. Because anti-resorptive agents, and I said this before, but through coupling, remember, they're linked together. So when we decrease bone resorption, we decrease bone formation. That is physiology, and we tend to forget it. So anything we take that slows bone resorption is also going to decrease the amount of new bone we can make. And which is one of the reasons now that most advocate for taking those strong anti-resorptive medicines for only five years. So basically, resorption and formation act differently on bone. This is sort of a in a petri dish kind of experiment. But you can see in the blue here where resorption is happening. And you can see here in orange where formation is happening. So if I asked you, just looking at these two rounds here, which is more likely to fracture, 
I think you'd say this one. And I think if you could combine the two, then fracture risk would be more decreased. So the question is, do we know that? So what happens if we put an anti-resorptive, which is the gold standard for osteoporosis, together with something that forms bone? Well, there's a lot of studies that have been playing around with this idea, adding PTH to alendronate, for example. And there's tricky things about who, which medicine you give first, etc. But here's another thing we need to say. Progesterone doesn't work at all on bone resorption. And if bone resorption is fast, you could take progesterone and still lose bone if resorption was really, you know, going really fast. And I learned that the hard way by giving women who'd had their ovaries removed, who had a rapid loss of estrogen, progesterone compared with estrogen. So the women on progesterone lost bone in spite of its best effort to build new bone. So we don't want to give progesterone alone for osteoporosis because resorption is the main thing that's causing bone loss. But could we improve fracture prevention in older women by adding progesterone to an anti-resorptive? Now, this is a question. I don't have data directly on this question, and it isn't a policy of Osteoporosis Canada to do this. But I'm asking a question because it's important that we treat hot flushes, night sweats, and sleep problems to prevent fracture. And it's also important that we prevent fracture. So first off, let's look. We saw already this diagram. Look here, and you can see that when you add a progestin, that works through the osteoblast progesterone receptor that you're increasing bone density more than you would otherwise with estrogen alone. So it looks like there's some additional effect of the progestin on bone density. Well, those trials were compared comparing estrogen with placebo, estrogen progestin with placebo. What if we said, what if we directly compared them? Estrogen, progesterone together versus estrogen alone. And it turns out there are a few studies that did that. And here's the, ester here's the combined therapy, here's estrogen alone. Now down here, we're looking at those who have greater bone gain on estrogen progestin, these who have greater bone gain on estrogen alone. And I think you can see that when you add progestin or progesterone to estrogen, we control resorption and we get a bonus of 0.68 of a percent per year addition. That's a highly significant effect. So there's an added bone density effect. There might be an added bone fracture prevention effect of the two together. Now, we were still talking about estrogen and bone. What about if I combined a bisphosphonate with progesterone? Now, we don't have much information. So I'm a person who in my clinical practice tried to do what the evidence said, even if it weren't a policy of the, you know, Osteoporosis Canada, for example. And I spoke with my patients about it and said, look, you need to take a tidronate. This was in the old days to slow bone loss before we had a lendronate and the other medicines. You, you need to take a tidronate to slow bone loss. I believe that progesterone increases bone formation. What if we took what if you took both? So that's what I did. But look, let's look at the data here. So first of all, we have, this is what a bunch of studies of intermittent cyclic etidronate, a meta-analysis of studies compared with placebo showed a gain in femoral neck bone density, not a big one, but a gain. <laughs> 
here are the studies from London, Ontario, a clinical, you know, patient study. And here's just a random selection of my patients, women patients with osteoporosis that got both therapies. And I think you can see there's a greater gain, although the variation is a lot because it's a small group. So now we've been talking about bone remodeling. We've been talking about the importance of estrogen and progesterone and the importance of balance, both in resorption formation and estrogen progesterone. But as you know, bone is not just that. It's living healthy lives. It's doing important things like this grandma in China, a picture I took when I was there in 72 with her grandchild doing a little shopping, grabbing some vegetables at the market. It's, it's living our lives in healthy ways. And I've tried to put it together into one ABCs, being physically active, having enough muscle and being normal and stable in weight, having 1200 to 2000 milligrams of calcium spread across the day. By the way, you get the biggest bang if you take some 500 of calcium at bedtime, because that's when bone resorption happens overnight. Vitamin D, 800 to 3,000 international units. I'm taking 3,000 at the moment, and it's safe up to 4,000. Being easygoing, in other words, low stress hormone levels that are hard on bones, which for some of us means treating hot flushes and treating sleep problems stimulating bone formation and having good habits like healthy diets with lots of vegetables and, and balanced um, proteins and avoiding the, the things that are high, high oxidative stress, avoiding smoking, for example, and in menopausal women, something to decrease bone resorption if we're at risk for fracture. <music> 